Thank you for being with us for this next lesson on time. We've been talking about time for quite some time. And today we want to talk about time and tongue. Many times it's not necessarily what we say or don't say, but what time was it? Was it time to talk? Was it time to be quiet? I read about a man who was driving 90 miles an hour in a 50 mile hour speed zone. Officer stopped him and came up and said, Sir, you were doing 90 miles an hour in a 50 mile speed zone. He said, Well, that's all right. It's free country. He said, Let me see your license. He said, I don't have any. He said, I drive just as well without them. And he said, Sir, I noticed also that your license plate has expired. And this time his wife interrupted. And she said, Officer, don't pay any attention to him. He always talks like that when he's drunk. Well, sometimes is not the best time to say certain things. And so we want to look at what Paul says as, as the theme for our, our presentation tonight. Colossians 4, verse 2. He says, Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant with thanksgiving. Prayer and thanksgiving are always good ways to use our time. Also, we need to look for God's wisdom and pray for open doors, verses 3 and 4. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would Open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. So how can I make the most of every opportunity with my tongue? Let's look at verses 5 and 6 in Colossians chapter 4. He says, Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. So, we ask the question, what am I going to say? I need to take time to think. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. James gave a principle in James 1 verse 19. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. Slow to anger. Listen, listen, listen. Think before you talk. And think a long time about how you're going to express your anger. One translation, translation says, Post this at every intersection. Dear friends, lead with your ears. Follow up with your tongues. And let anger struggle along in the, real, in the rear. It's like a carpenter said, you need to measure twice and saw once because after you've sawed and sawed short, it's too late to do it again. So the first question we need to ask, is it true? Ephesians 4.25, Paul said, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. I got a call several years ago about a well-known preacher in the Brotherhood, and it says, has he quit the church? I said, well, I hadn't heard anything about it. He said, well, I heard it. I heard it. He had quit the church. I said, well, I know how to find out. And he said, how's that? I said, call and ask him. 
At that point, I wasn't as differentiated as I am now. I would have told him then, why don't you call him? I have his phone number, but I said, I'll call him and let you know. So I, I called his home number. That was before the days of cell phones. And I said, I need to talk to uh, this man. Called his name, and she said, well, he's not here. I'll give you... I'll give you a phone number. He's holding a gospel meeting in Louisiana, staying with an elder. So I called that elder's house, asked to speak for the preacher. And I said, just call to ask you a question. Have you quit the church? I said, I just got a call from somebody, said they had heard that. He said, well, I don't think so. I've just finished speaking in a gospel meeting about 30 minutes ago, and I don't think I've quit since then. But people were saying, here's this man's quit the church. Sometime later, I was at Fried Hardeman Lectureship, and somebody asked, have you heard that this preacher, another well-known preacher in the Brotherhood, have you heard that he's gone crossroads? Now, that doesn't make sense to a lot of people if you hadn't heard about it, but this was an issue that came up several years ago uh, that drew away a lot of people and disturbed a lot of people. So I said, I don't know, don't think so. I said, I think the man's too hard-headed to ever have a prayer partner, but... I know how to find out for sure. How could we find out? I said, call and ask him. And again, I called and I checked with him and it was not true. So I need to ask, first of all, is it true? Number two, I need to be sure that in telling the truth that I'll make promises about time that I'll keep. This came out in the Wall Street Journal several years ago. Don't promise what you can't deliver. I'll have your part in two weeks. Four weeks later, the parts arrive. I'll put it in your hand the minute you walk in the door. But all you get when you walk in is a handshake. Dinner will be at six. But as you dip your spoon in the soup, the clock strikes 7.45. The doctor will see you in five minutes. 35 minutes later, you're greeted cheerfully, and how are we today? Avoid a lot of grief and inconvenience for the people you deal with. Think before you announce how long something will take, and then deliver what you promised on time. Robert Townsend wrote this. If asked when you can deliver something, ask for time to think. Build in a margin of safety. Name a date. Then deliver it earlier than you promised. The world is divided into two classes of people. The few people who make good on their promises, even if they don't promise as much, and the many who don't. Get in column A and stay there. You'll be very valuable wherever you are. What am I going to say? What am I going to say? Another question to ask, is it time to say no? There was a time when I thought to be the kind of Christian that I needed to be, that I needed to just do whatever everybody wanted me to. However, Jesus teaches me better than that if I'll simply listen to his words. Mark chapter 10, verse 35, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask. That's like somebody saying, will you do me a favor? What's your first inclination? If it's a good friend, somebody, sure, sure, anything you want, just tell me. Tell me. But Jesus didn't do it that way. He said to them, what do you want me to do for you? Good response. And they were good friends. They were apostles. They were brothers. And they said, will you do us a favor? And he said, I don't know. What do you want me to do? Just saying, sure, anything you want is like taking a check, signing my name in the lower right-hand side and hand it to the person and say, you fill in the amount. Anything you want to put down will be fine. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time. I don't have an un um, enough ability to give anybody an unsigned check for what they want me to do. So they said to him, Grant us that we may sit, one on your right hand, the other on your left, in your glory. 
But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with him? They said, We're able. So Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink the cup that I drink, and with the baptism I'm baptized with, you will be baptized, but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared. Jesus said, that's really not my business. If you read the account in the book of Matthew, it says that's part of the Father's business of assigning certain people to certain tasks. Number two, how am I going to say it? I need to take time to think. Or as Paul said, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside. Redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. I need to take time and decide how to use my anger. In Proverbs 15, verse 1, there Solomon wrote, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Solomon said it makes a difference how you answer someone. Is it harsh or is it soft? I need to take time to think. Ephesians 4, 26. Be angry. Do not sin. Do not let the sun go down upon your wrath. Psalm 4, verse 4. Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart, upon your bed, and be still. All of these emphasize I need to think not only the content, is it true or is it false, but I also need to think about what is the tone, what time, when is the best circumstance. When is the best time? What are the best circumstances to approach this issue with this person? I need time to acquire wisdom about how to respond. Well, what do you mean? Well, there, there are different ways. Two of the most interesting proverbs to me are found in Proverbs 26, verses 4 and 5, which illustrates what a proverb is. A proverb is a proverb. That simply means that a proverb is generally this is the way things happen. It's not that it'll always be that way. It's that way 100% of the time. Oh, you don't believe the Bible? Believe every word of it, but a proverb is a proverb. For instance, Proverbs 15.1, which we just read, a soft answer turns away wrath. Is that true with every person every time? Absolutely not. You can be just as kind and gentle as you can be, and there's some people who are so angry they'll burst out at you regardless of what kind of tone or approach that you use. But generally, if you use the soft answer, it will diffuse the conflict. But notice Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like him. Okay, so if you're talking to a fool, that is a person who is ignorant and proud of it, someone who is not willing to look at words of wisdom, don't answer a fool according to his folly lest you be like him. Good, I know exactly how to approach somebody like that. Well, until I read verse 5. Verse 5 says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Hmm. Verse 4 says, do not answer a fool according to his folly. Verse 5 says, answer a fool according to his folly. Well, what am I going to do when I'm talking to one of those people who is ignorant and doesn't want to get any smarter? We asked a teacher one time in a Bible class, and we said, well, how do you know what to do? And here was his answer, the best I've ever heard. You have, to, you have to decide what kind of fool you're talking to. And it takes time. You need to take time to think about that as I'm trying to get my responses correct. Number three. Is it time to talk to this person 
or this group. Take time to think. Walk in wisdom to, toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace. Season with salt that you may know how you ought to answer each one. So not only do I need to tell the truth, I need to approach it the best possible way. I need to ask, is it time? It might be good 15 minutes from now. It might be a good time two days from now. I might need to wait three months. When's the best time? Would it be a misuse of time to present this message to this person? Jesus said in Matthew 7, 6, Do not give that which is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and tear you to pieces. He said there are some people that you don't need to present good stuff to them because they will disrespect it and destroy it and you. Is it time to tell this information to this person or this group of people? For instance, have you ever heard the saying, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all? So what mama always said, grandmother always said, well, that's interesting and there's kindness in that idea, but it's not always true. How do I know? The Bible tells me so. Paul, an inspired writer, said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm, May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. There are some evil people who do evil things, and after we have done everything that Jesus tells us to do, then many times the best thing we can do is to warn other people not to get entrapped in their schemes. It's important not to say what a person has done wrong to the wrong person at the wrong time. There's a passage, Proverbs 26, 20. When I go to a church where there's conflict, I always know two things. Number one, somebody's been gossiping. How do I know? The Bible tells me so. Proverbs 26, 20. Where there is no wood, the fire goes out. Where there's no tail bear, where there's no one gossiping, Strife ceases. That is the end. And so the problem is somebody has been saying something to somebody else that shouldn't be saying it to that person at this time. Just not time to do it. And closely associated with that, I know that people have not been following what Jesus taught about how to resolve problems between people. Matthew 18, verses 15 to 17. Jesus said, if somebody sins against you, and that simply means somebody misses the mark to the extent that it has affected your relationship. If somebody sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And so somebody has hurt me, somebody has offended me, it's, it's hurting our relationship What do I need to do? I need to talk about it. But I need to talk about it in a certain context. I need to talk about it with that person alone. That means there's two people in this meeting. There's me and this person who has missed the mark, who has offended me. Jesus said, if he hear you, you gain your brother. Now, if he doesn't hear take if he doesn't hear you, take with you one or two more, that of the mouth of two witnesses, every word may be established. See, I often tell people, you can't obey Matthew 18, 15, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone by having a fit in the foyer. There's too many people there, only two people in this meeting. But now it's time to bring in the second person. And so we've talked, we've, we've reasoned, and we're just not making any progress. What I have tried that works better than than other things that I've tried is say to this person, you know, we've been working on this quite a while. I remember one situation I said, we've been working on this for several months and I really can't tell we're making any progress. 
I'm doing the best I know to reconcile this, and I assume you're doing the same, but we're not making any progress. We're where we were six months ago. Let me make a suggestion. Why don't you invite some good Christian person that you trust and I trust, and I'll invite some Christian person that I trust and you trust, and let's invite them to sit down with us and let us explain the difficulty that we're having. Let's see if they can help us. And I suggest let's don't tell our story before they get here. Now, another way that I've tried it years ago, somebody would offend me. I want to obey Matthew 18, 16, take with you one or two more. I'd go get a couple of my friends and I'd tell them how dirty this person has treated me. Will you go with me and try to help them get straightened out? Now, which one of those ways do you think works the best? My experience has been you select one, I'll select one. Let's get together and let them help us. And so the idea is not for me to win and them to lose or the other way around. The idea is for us to be reconcile, be brought back together. So that's the time to do that. And then Jesus said, if you won't hear them, then tell it to the church. See, there's a time to tell everybody. But it's after I've talked with them by themselves and then after one or two more has, has joined in the conversation and then we're ready to tell everybody. And then he said, if he refuses to them, uh, hear them, let him be as a heathen and a tax collector. You know, it's interesting, the process. That same thing is to be done with uh, leaders, elders in the Lord's church. Leaders receive a lot of criticism. And whether they realize it or not, that is normal and that goes with the territory. When you or I become a leader, elder, deacon, teacher, parent, grandparent, any time where we interact with people, where we have some supervisory uh, capacity in relationship to them, we're inviting criticism. A leader is more like a lightning rod than they are like a wall decoration that is to be admired and saying, oh, isn't that cute? That is wonderful. Wish I had one like that. No, a leader is a lightning rod. What's the purpose of a lightning rod? It is to attract lightning and you're standing up tall and saying, hit me, hit me, hit me, hit me. The lightning comes and it goes down to the ground and it saves the building. And so it's going to come. But listen to what Paul says as you deal with criticism against a leader. 1 Timothy 5, verses 19 and 20. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. Often summarize 1 Timothy 5, 19 by saying, don't believe everything you hear about an elder. That's exactly what he's saying. If somebody comes and tells you this man did this or didn't do this, well, uh, that must have been disappointing. Will you go talk to him for me? Well, I'm not going to talk to him for you. Uh, but who else heard that or saw that? Well, nobody else, just me. Well, I know it concerns you, but I cannot get involved in that at this time because Paul said I cannot receive an accusation against an elder unless I have at least two, and really three witnesses would be better. So, when somebody else, he'll probably do it again or she'll probably do it again if that's the kind of person they are. When you get somebody else, let's see how we need to proceed. Now, if in fact they are sinning, those who sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. But what people do many times, they start rebuking before all. They start talking to others. And here we've, we're out at this restaurant. Do you know what brother so-and-so did? And, Get on Facebook and say, did you know this happened? And it ain't it awful. And, but we hadn't done what Jesus said do. One, have a meeting. Two people. Two, get with you one or two more. And then th number three, it's time to start telling everybody. But I need to do it in that, in that sequence. However, Paul 
writes to Titus, and he said there is a time when you need to have two strikes and you're out. Jesus said three strikes and you're out. Talk to a person by themselves, one or two witnesses. Tell it to the church after listening to the church for a while. If they won't listen, then let them be as a heathen and a tax collector. Listen to what Paul writes to Titus. Verses, Titus 3, verses 10 and 11. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. A divisive person, a person who is sowing discord among God's people, that needs quick action. And incidentally, a divisive person many times is a person who is spreading gossip and doing it over and over again. Need to end that. Jesus said three strikes and you're out. Paul said two strikes and you're out. Don't let that keep going because it will ruin any group. Number four. Is it time to speak this message? I need to take time to think. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside. Redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace. Season with salt that you may know how you ought to answer each one. And so I ask the question, before I start talking, I need to ask myself, have I taken the time to listen? Proverbs 18, verse 13. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. Have I really listened to try to understand what's going on? Have I taken the time to listen to different viewpoints? Many times if people are at odds with each other, I'll hear one side and I'll say, wow, I don't know how anybody could put up with something that they've been putting up with until I listen to the other person. Proverbs 18, 17. The first to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. So I need to listen to the other side to get a perspective on it. Is it appropriate to say at this time, whatever I'm saying and the way I'm saying it, would it be a blessing or a curse? Interesting passage in Proverbs 27, 14. He who blesses his neighbor with a loud voice early in the morning, it shall be counted a curse to him. So here's someone who's giving a blessing, but they're talking too loud and they're probably waking people up and that's not a good way to wake somebody up. So even though you're saying good stuff too loud at the wrong time, it's like cursing them. And so I need to, again, what am I saying it? When am I saying it? How am I saying it? It's good to think, is, it, is the person ready to hear this? Jesus made an interesting observation in John 16, 12. I have many things to say to you, but you are not able to bear them yet. Jesus said, I've got some things, but I'm not going to tell you right now because you're not ready for it. I need to ask that question. Is it time to speak this message to those who are outside? That's what Colossians 4, 5, and 6 says. Walk in wisdom to, toward those who are outside redeeming the time. I need to think about how I talk to non-Christians. There are many things that I'd say to brothers and sisters in Christ that would not be appropriate to say to those who have not yet made that commitment. Do you have the wisdom to say it? James says, if you lack wisdom, pray to God. He'll give it to you. Solomon says in Proverbs 2, verses 1 through 5, you need to work for wisdom. You need to search for wisdom like you search for buried treasure and work for it like you work for money. Also, I need to be sure that what I'm saying and what I'm doing correspond. In 1 Peter chapter 3, Verses 15 and 16, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. 
having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. May God help us to say the right thing at the right time to the right person in the right way. If there's any way I can be helpful, feel free to call 615-584-0512. Thank you for listening today. Oh, will you not stand here?